loser. I ain't gonna stay up this week editing because I have an excuse. After the usual intro of Oishina Town that kind of feels pointless considering where the grand majority of this episode is going to take place, we opened at the Lair of the Bundles where a certain TMNT reject had been reactivated, though at least with a lot less of that annoying personality. No, and Secretary said that they were finally going to get super serial. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it, lady. Thankfully, we then immediately cut over to the best character of the show, along with Rosemary, still partaking in that good old police brutality. He wanted to take their captive back to Cook Kingdom whilst giving his friends a tour of his home. However, apparently that would require two working special delicious stones, and they didn't even have one because his was broken. <laughs> That makes sense to me. Yeah, as if this character didn't already feel like an undeserving god baby, may as well praise her more and play some epic music in the background. So they made their way to the world of Sugar Rush. <laughs> and Mulfern is already filing for copyright infringement. Seriously, I'm just kidding when I call this guy King Candy, but this place really does look like that world from Wreck It Ralph with how it mostly is made of sweets. Y'all need more than just a few broccoli and carrot trees to have a balanced diet, you know. Hell, even the clouds were made of cotton candy, which led to predictable results. Yeah, is it just hilarious how this character has no personality other than being dangerously gluttonous? Anyway, I guess this kingdom was dealing with its own pandemic as their masked up guards took in Narcissus. <laughs> Literally, just that little bit of silence was some of the best storytelling of this whole damn show. With that, our heroines finally met with the royalty of this show and jeez. Um, I'm not sure if this dude is just kind of off mall in this episode, but King Candy is looking like he had a little too much candy. He's fat! Hey, at least Steiner wasn't as rude as our main heroines. Yeah, don't worry, we'll just behead you two and then we'll be all square. They also met Doctor Strange and his vassal Sherval, yes an African herb, who turned out to be a tall fangirl of the Precure. And yes, fangirl, as has been confirmed by the character designer Kyoko Yufu. Believe me, I'm just as disappointed as you that we didn't get another fanboy, but at least we got more confirmation that Crunchyroll sucks at their job. And through her, we actually managed to get some good world building about how Cook Kingdom's military and ranking system operated. Likewise, we got some more intrigue from her superiors who discussed how the bundle stones were actually well-made forgeries of the kingdom stones to the point that they pretty much had all the same powers and abilities. This led to Doctor Strange contemplating who the forger might be and not at all acting sus. Speaking of which, Secretor managed to sneak into the kingdom because why should we assume this place has good security with this guy in charge? Also, ew, don't share your mask, that's how you spread the virus. Meanwhile, Sherfu continued the tours by showing some of the very impossible produce they were creating with Kokune and Amani intently listening while Ron and Yui kept eating things without permission because that's all these characters are at this point. She also showed off their idea of fishing with more than just fish. <laughs> So essentially, y'all recreated the technology from Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. Well, there's worse Sony Amis she could steal from. To this show's credit, I do appreciate that they acknowledge that a lot of this quote-unquote tech can only work in their magical fantasy world. Granted, it still doesn't explain how any of it works or acknowledges how impractical a lot of it is, but whatever, it's good world building for this particular world. And after learning about the world, they tried to learn more about their guide and her own trials and tribulations. Because yeah, as it turned out, this soldier was likely there as a favor to someone, as her skill set was very limited. <laughs> okay, Minami Tsuda is someone who I've never really considered to be a great VA, but damn if she's not trying here and making this character just charming. 
And as cliched and overly shonen as all of this is, I actually do think they have a good discussion of what courage is here. It doesn't really speak much to the characters, but more on that later. Anyway, Sekiro is struck and huh, no real capture animation here. And she would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for that pesky unfemboy, even though she probably could have just have lied her way out of here, but I guess she also had to show off her summoning animation, which wow, that is underwhelming. Yeah, I'm just gonna assume between this and the lack of an actual capture animation, this episode will be a one-off thing for her and she'll be replaced with the Robo Turtle starting next week. Figures this chick would clock out already like she's been doing for almost the entirety of this series. Anyway, they fought another rock monster, minus the drill, so automatic zero there. I mean, at least they had a decent beginning to their fight until uh, they were captured to give Sherver her shining moment, and I'm guessing this moment was what confused the subtitlers. <laughs> I mean, come on, this franchise clearly wishes it was Madoka at this point. With that, she gave the cures an opening to finish it off, and they reported it to the king. King Candy, I think more than anything, you should be worried about your diabetes. With that, the episode ended with Yui trying to act like a main character. And more interestingly, with Rosemary and Doctor Strange discussing the possibility that Takumi's dad might have been framed for his crimes, kind of wish they had discussed this more throughout the episode, but at least they're establishing something. Also, on their way home through the portal, they saw clips of the previous three seasons of the franchise. Gee, I wonder if this is meant to tie into anything, like a movie they're desperately trying to sell. I mean, they certainly wouldn't try to force it into this episode with no rhyme or reason, right? This honestly was one of the better episodes of the series, if only because we finally got some much needed world building almost 30 episodes in. I mean, yeah, don't look a gift horse in the mouth and all that. And to be fair, there was some creative stuff here, and Sherba was the delightful character. That said, it also did kind of highlight how I find almost everything in the show, aside from our main heroines, to be more interesting. I will say, it was nice to finally get a good look at Cook Kingdom in the show, if only to establish what sort of world our protagonists are trying to fight for. And as silly as some of their quote-unquote tech was, at least they were trying to establish some deeper lore with it, like how it's incompatible with the human world. That said, I was never crazy on the design of this world, as it does feel a little too derivative of every Candyland-esque fantasy world, even though it's supposed to be a world of all foods. Nah, no, I just wish the castle didn't look like Hansel and Gretel's fever dream. Still, what made this episode for me was the side characters, minus these two. The conflict between the older cook fighters involving a possible mole and other conspiracies was actually quite interesting, as was kind of their military structure which we got to see through the charming little apprentice in Sherville. Her determination and scrappiness were admirable, and even Minami Tsuda's sometimes awkward acting just added to the character. Honestly, it's a bit of a shame that she and her fellow Yuri co-star Yuka Utsubo have only been used as side characters in this franchise, as I also think they would make good pre-cure, and so far, only the pink yandere has been a cure. But yeah, speaking of which, easily the least engaging part of this episode was unfortunately our main heroines. I mean, I get that they would have to take a bit of a backseat to this sort of stuff, but it also ended up highlighting how little some of these characters have been developed. Not helped by the fact that Ron and Yuri were turned into mostly one-note jokes in this one. The latter especially, with her grammar quotes having all but devolved into hollow platitudes. Hell, even the big courage speech from Amane doesn't exactly highlight what little character she has, on top of being a bit derivative. Now, if this episode had come out much earlier in the season, as it really should have to establish what they were fighting for, I wouldn't complain about their lack of development. However, now that the episodes are entering into the 30s, not only does a lot of this ring hollow, but it makes the flashbacks to previous seasons feel unearned. In my opinion, stuff like this should be reserved for either anniversary series, or shows that have truly earned it with heroines who lived up to their moniker. And so far with this team, I really can't say that. Thus overall, while the world building here was much appreciated, I also do wish we could have actually started building our main characters, rather than introducing more new characters who I feel have more interesting stories to tell. 
But honestly, I did need kind of a break from the show, especially on my birthday of all days. Yeah, another year, and uh, another reminder that I should probably worry about my metabolism more than these characters. Still, that's not gonna stop me from making videos, like the conclusion to my Yu-Gi-Oh! openings ranking video, which should be out later this week on the secondary channel. So to look forward to that, and until then though, for now my friends, and uh, Damn it, the weather report said that there was a low chance to be gay, so... Can I get my laundry back in?